Okay. All right. All right. Okay. I've got good news and bad news. And it's the same news, and it's that. I really like this watch. So it's good in that I like nice things. Liking things makes me feel better than not liking things. But it's also bad news in that I shouldn't own this. I can't own this. I won't own this. Not gonna do it. Wouldn't be prudent. Until now, this Glashütte Original Panomatic Lunar hasn't really been on my radar, at least not as a watch that might appeal to me. I've seen these around a bit, and they always looked interesting, but I just never saw the Panomatic as a watch I might enjoy wearing. But I respect the brand, and people have asked me to make a video about this watch, so why not? And then within moments of putting this on, the wow happened. Maybe, maybe you know the wow? It happens only sometimes, actually not that often for me. So when it does happen, I try to figure out why, because understanding why you like a thing or why you dislike a thing, that can teach you a lot about yourself. Like for example, that despite wanting to be a sporty guy, you're actually a delicate fancy boy, just for example. But this isn't a perfect watch, very far from it, and not just because a perfect watch doesn't exist, and this piece certainly isn't going to appeal to most people, so let's get into what I like, what I don't like, and most importantly, why. But first, some facts. The Panomatic Lunar has been around for almost 20 years. It first came out in 2003, and somehow that's almost 20 years ago. There have been silver dials and black dials and blue dials, but only in 2020 did Glashütte Original first produce the green Panomatic Lunar. This watch is 40 millimeters across, 12.7 millimeters thick, and 47 millimeters long. It takes 20 millimeter straps. It weighs 91 grams on this leather strap with the matching deployant buckle, and it has 50 meters of water resistance. I'm not totally sure what this means. Glashütte Original says that all its watches with 50 meters or more are actually pressure tested for that depth. So I interpret that as these being relatively water resistant. Oh, and by watching this video, you agree that I cannot be held legally responsible for any damage to your watch or your bank account. Just a side note. $10,100 is the price for the Panomatic Lunar on a strap. If you've never seen this watch or a watch like this, you're probably confused or surprised or intrigued by this dial. And I'm talking about the layout, the color we'll get to. A dial layout like this isn't new, it's been done on watches before and on clock faces for a long time. But it can be an acquired taste that some people just never acquire. I get that. Hours and minutes on one dial, seconds on another dial, an overlapping dial. Moon phase in the top right, big date in the bottom right. Asymmetrical, that's the simplest way to describe a dial like this. I spent some time studying design in school and so I wanted to find out what might have guided this specific dial layout. Is there something about how all the dials, all the circles are arranged? Doesn't seem like it. How about the rule of thirds? Everyone loves the rule of n no, not seeing it. Maybe the golden ratio of Fibonacci spiral? Yeah, okay, maybe the Fibonacci spiral, but even that seems tenuous. Honestly, I still don't know why this dial is the way that it is, but I don't need to know. I like it all the same. The two main dials have a lovely guilloche finishing that produces a kind of sunburst effect in different lights. And the seconds hand dial is sunken slightly below the hour and minutes dial, which gives just a bit of depth. The markers are polished and applied, and the minutes and hour hands have a little loom, maybe enough to get you through a movie in a dark theater. And both the date aperture and the moon phase aperture have some very cool beveling around them. The moon phase dial is really nice. There are stars polished onto a matte silver disc, and the moon is embossed and curved and polished. Then around the aperture are the markers for the 29 and a half days of the lunar month. Not that you can really read the numbers or that they matter much, but hey, it's still far out. The date is known as a big date, and it's one that uses a different disc for each numeral. These discs are concentric, which means they can be at the same depth, unlike some watches from Langa, where one numeral sits higher than the other. We love a big date, don't we folks? And if you ever get confused about which window shows the moon phase and which one shows the date, there are labels for each near the outside of the dial. But if you don't know which is which, you have bigger problems, and I encourage you to stop watching this video and call emergency services immediately, but 
Again, I cannot be held legally responsible. Just know and remember that. And then there's the color of the dial. It's a fume green. That means it's darker near the edges and lighter towards the center. And it's this color in this application that first wowed me when I put this watch on. And when I started taking pictures of it, I had to check myself. It looked like I had applied filters to the photos, but I hadn't. This dial, I don't know, it looks almost like an emerald that's being lit from behind. It's really vivid and spectacular in the true meaning of that word. The watch is powered by the in-house caliber 90-2 movement, and it's a looker. It has glashütte stripes, blued screws, and an off-center rotor which mimics the asymmetry of the dial. The balance bridge is fascinating. It's engraved by hand and uses swan neck regulators on each side. I don't know entirely why there are two regulators, but it's got some undeniable cool factor. The 90-2 movement has 42 hours of power reserve and uses 47 joules. My initial concern about this watch was the thickness. 12.7 millimeters is not very thick for a sports watch. That's about the same as a Rolex Submariner and thinner than an Omega Aquaterra. Thinner than just about any Omega actually, not that I'm angry. But for a dressy watch, 12.7 sounded kind of chunky and meh, it kind of is. A millimeter thinner would be ideal. I'd prefer that. And here's the big chunky butt. But I've had no issues with the thickness of this watch. I've been wearing this for a week and I don't really notice it on my 7 inch wrist. With 40 millimeters of diameter and 47 millimeter length, the proportions are appropriate. And this is clearly intended to be a modernly sized dress watch. Again, thinner would be better, but if you like larger watches and you're looking for something that's not a sports watch, this could be it. And the case does a fair job of honoring the pristinely finished dial and the movement. The case is elegant, simple, clean, same with the deploying clasp. I'm not a fan of most deploying clasps, and that includes this one. I just find them too bulky and a little uncomfortable. And I might be in the minority on that. I think if I own this watch, I'd put it on a strap with a normal buckle. It's less secure, but hey, that's why we have watch insurance. That's right, I have insurance for my watches because you gotta spend money to save money, as they say. Wait, do they say that? I can tell that this is one watch I'm going to think about after I return it to the Swatch Group. And honestly, I did not expect to be so enamored by this watch. Enamored with. Enamored of. I'm not buying it, let's be clear. It doesn't really fit my budget. Or rather, I think I'd feel uncomfortable with a $10,000 watch that I probably couldn't swim with. And maybe that's a criticism of the watch or a criticism of me. But I'm satisfied just knowing that this emerald hottie is out there, even if it's not in my collection. We'll always have this video.